back a few weeks ago when we first started talking about the Gospel of John, and we started talking about when Jesus called the disciples. Uh, one of the disciples that he called was Andrew. Andrew, the brother of Simon. Andrew goes to Simon, if you recall. If not, I'll refresh your memory. Andrew goes to Simon and says, we have found the one. We have found the Messiah. So Simon goes to meet Jesus. And in that first meeting, Jesus immediately says, you are Simon, son of John. I will call you Cephas. Cephas means Peter, which means rock in Greek. In that moment, when Jesus called Peter to be a disciple, he also called him to be the rock. And again, I know it's a corny joke, but I have to say it. Not Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> Different rock. The bedrock of the church. Peter was supposed to be the solid ground on which the church was to be built. And to give him credit, Peter tried. He tried to live into that name. As we go through the Gospel of John, we see Peter trying to be that rock, trying to be the most engaged in what Jesus is doing, asking all the questions, always being zealous. Last week, with the washing of the feet, y'all may remember, Jesus is going around to the disciples, and he says, I'm going to wash your feet, and Peter says, oh no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. I'm trying to be the rock. And Jesus says, no, I have to. So Peter says, okay, then my hands and my head too. Trying to be the rock. And Jesus says, that's not necessary. He didn't watch the rest of them either. All throughout, Peter is trying to be the rock because Jesus called him the rock. John Calvin called Peter stupid. <laughs> you know who John Calvin is? Was about 500 years ago, he was one of the reformers. He wrote a lot of theology, he wrote a lot about the scriptures, a lot of his theology is the basis for our Presbyterian theology. John Calvin called Peter stupid twice. In his commentary, when he's writing about John, he says that when Peter first denies, when the maid or the woman asks him, are you not one of his disciples, and Peter says, I am not, John Calvin says, then... Peter goes and warms himself by the fire with the slaves of the high priest and the police officers. And he says, how stupid is that? <laughs> and then, after denying who he is, who Jesus is, two more times, Calvin says, and let me get it right, Calvin goes on to say, how shocking is Peter's stupidity because he remained in the company of those wicked men. So which is it? Is Peter the rock or is Peter stupid? That's rhetorical, you don't have to answer. My gut tells me he's somewhere in between. Somewhere in between of being the rock whom Jesus called him to be, and being as stupid as Calvin claims him to be. One of the great things about this passage and about this view into Peter's life is that it shows us the limitations of Peter's faith, or at least the limitations of his words of faith. And it reminds us that Peter, the rock, was also human. And it reminds us, or at least it does me, of myself and my own limitations in the faith, or my own limitations in life. Because you see, when Peter denies Jesus, denies being a disciple, he's not just denying Jesus, he's denying who he is. The woman asked him, are you not one of his disciples? And he says, I am not. He has forgotten, or 
he is denying who he is. Not only is he denying to be a disciple, he is denying his relationship with Christ. Denying the friendship that must have built over three years of travel together. He is denying his friend. And in so doing, he is denying who he is. So, this made me remember a friend of mine. Uh, we grew up together. Uh, we'll call him Dave, just in case you ever meet him. And uh, Dave and I were great friends. We went to school together. Uh, we would go to church together from time to time. We spent the night together. I mean, we were always at each other's house. And uh, as you know, as I have confessed to you in the past, and is evident in the way I live, I'm a geek. Always was a geek, so all my friends were geeks. We just weren't the cool kids. So in middle school, uh, my brother was dating a girl. Remember, my brother's older than I am. And the girl he was dating, her younger brother was one of the cool kids in our middle school. And I was like in sixth grade, and he was like in eighth grade. So not only is he the big eighth grader, he's also the cool eighth grader on campus. And one day, uh, my brother's girlfriend and her younger brother are at our house, and there's a picture of me and my friend Dave uh, right out there on the mantle for everyone to see. And this cool eighth grader says, hey, is this your friend? We like to make fun of him in school. And I'm like, no, that's not my friend. I, don't, I barely know that guy. I don't know why I said that. I don't know if I was trying to impress the cool eighth grader. I don't know if I was intimidated by the cool eighth grader. I don't know why I just blurted that. No, that's not my friend. Even though he'd probably just been at my house the day before. And in that moment, I denied that friendship. Now, my friend never knew about this. Um, he never knew that I had denied knowing him or claiming what a good relationship we had. But in that moment, I still deny who I was by denying that relationship. I denied that I was Dave's friend. And so when we hear this story of Peter and we are reminded of his limitations when he denies knowing Christ, denies being a disciple, we don't know why he does it. I mean, it could be part of some bigger plan that he had in mind. It could be out of fear. It could be because he's just stuck and doesn't know what to do. We don't know his motivations for why he denies. We just know that Peter has limitations, even though we don't know his motivations. Now, Peter, after this, is, as you can imagine, pretty down. But we know that it gets up again. You know, as the story continues, after the resurrection, Jesus has another special, intimate encounter with his friend and with his disciple, Peter. It's in the morning, it's on the beach, there's a breakfast, some fish smoking over the fire, and Jesus asks, the resurrected Lord asks Peter, Simon, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Three times. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Jesus didn't give up on Peter. The life of faith continued, and he was the rock on whom the church was built. Faith is difficult. It's not a black and white issue. It's gray most of the time. There's not always one exact answer for every situation or every person. Thankfully, in this case, Jesus knew who Peter really was. He knew what really mattered. Have you all ever heard of the novel by um, Yusaka Ido named Silence? It's written in 1966. About two years ago, Martin Scorsese made it into a movie beautiful movie. It was up for an Academy Award for cinematography. But the movie Silence is about Japan in the 1500s and the 1600s. You see, in the 1500s, Japan first started allowing Jesuit priests, monks, missionaries into the country. 
And when they came into the country and started preaching the gospel, they converted and baptized hundreds of thousands of Japanese. I think the number was somewhere around 300,000 Christians uh, came to live in Japan. And everything was going great. And then there was a regime change. And the new regime didn't want the Jesuits in the country anymore, so they kicked them out of the country. But some of them were able to stay behind. And in secret, they began to leave the underground church. Well, the new regime, in an attempt to stamp out this underground church, went after them. The book, the movie, is about these two Jesuit priests from the 1600s who have heard that one of their mentors, who was in Japan, has given up the faith. <coughs> so they go to investigate. And they go into this Japan with this underground church, and they go there to feed the souls and to tend the sheep of the flock. And they're found out. Well, the new regime decides to ask people whether or not they are Christians. And the test is, they have these images. You can, there are still some of these artifacts available. You can view them online if you wanted to. But they are these images of Christ. And they call them the fumier. And they would put the fumier on the ground and they would ask them, are you a Christian? If they said, no, they said, then trample on the image of Christ. Or sometimes it was to spit on the image of Christ. So, what they found out was that those who would not trample, those who would not spit, were to be tortured, sometimes to the point of death, until they trampled, until they spit. But what the regime found out is that this just emboldened all the other Christians. They saw their fellows in the faith being brave heroes, and so they too wanted to be those people in the faith. So they tried a new tactic. They decided to go after the Jesuits, to go after the leaders of the faith. If they could get the Jesuits to trample, then the rest of the church would die out. But they found out that the Jesuits were just as stubborn in their faith. So they started a new tactic. The new tactic was to torture the Christians, even the ones who had already trampled, and to make the Jesuits watch. And to tell them, Unless you trample, you are doing this to them. In the climactic scene in the movie, one of the Jesuits is standing there, and many of his flock are right in front of him. And he knows, these are the people I came to save, to tend for our Lord, and because of me, they are being tortured to the point of death. And as he's looking at the fumier, the image of Christ on the ground, he hears the voice of Christ. And the voice of Christ says to him, trample, trample. I, more than anyone, know the pain in your foot. Trample. It was to be trampled on by men that I was born into this world. It was to share men's pain that I carried my cross. And the priest did trample, to save those of the faith that he had come to feed. Faith is hard. It's not black and white. And the reality is, we don't know people's motivations. But thankfully, the one who judges us in the end knows us. Knows what is inside of us. Just as Jesus knew what was inside of Peter, our Lord knows what is inside each and every one of us. And thankfully, it is our Lord who judges our faith. No one else. And just as it is the Lord who judges other people's faith and not us. In the end, Jesus is there 